be in HR. Cher Owen told me that she and her team had introduced more innovations in the past three years than in the previous 10. And I don't think she's unique in that regard. I mean, collectively, we've taken a stand on some of the most controversial issues of the day. We've implemented a once-in-a-generation shift to remote and hybrid work, invested in the well-being of our employees, accessed previously untapped pools of non-traditional candidates, and, of course, adopted the new technologies to make it all run seamlessly. <laughs> in short, we've been very, very busy. But even more importantly, we've made incredible progress. It, yes, we do still have more to do, and yes, we are still learning and adapting to this new reality. But what we've accomplished so far is remarkable. As a result, HR stock is rising. Long gone are the days of fighting for a seat at the metaphorical table. Now, 83% of HR leaders say that they're expected to do more. 74% report that their organizations rely on them more heavily. And 70% say that they have more opportunities for impact. The bottom line is this. You are now in a better position than ever before to help your organization break boundaries and unlock new dimensions of human performance. As you can see, 58% of HR leaders have more authority to determine strategic priorities. Not influence, authority. And that's a good thing, because where we're going, we're going to need it. We absolutely will, Brent. You know, in preparing for today, I was thinking of a saying I had heard. It's a proverb, actually, from the country of Haiti. Mountains beyond mountains. In other words, for every mountain that we have summited, there is yet another mountain still waiting to be scaled. Economic volatility, social polarization, DEI pushback, generative AI, these are just a few of the distant and, well, not so distant peaks that we can currently see on the horizon. That's quite a view out there, isn't it? These towering peaks, they may seem daunting, but as HR leaders, we have to climb them. Our employees, our CEOs need us once again to take the lead, just as we have so many times over these last few years. Now, Brent mentioned the progress that we've made. But just as we're gaining ground, it feels like it's starting to slip away. 82% of HR leaders are facing pressure right now to scale back or reverse the progress that they've made. So we're finding ourselves in a tough spot. We're at the risk of undoing the very things that we just celebrated together. So what can we do? Well, we believe that the HR leaders who will be best prepared for the future will be the ones who embrace a new posture, one that we call everyday bold. Hey, just let that sink in for a minute. Everyday bold. What, what images do those words conjure for you? Well, perhaps when we hear everyday, we may think of things like walking the dog, catching the train, or getting a coffee in the morning from your favorite barista. And I have to say, I'm pretty lucky on this one. My nine-year-old son, he runs a pretty good delivery service. <laughs> and what about bold? Do you think of gymnasts defying the laws of gravity, or, or NASCAR drivers blasting through the turns? Or, or what about something truly terrifying, like DIY home renovation? <laughs> Now, what happens when we try to combine these words together? Every day, bold. Do they fit? Is it an oxymoron? That's precisely what we're going to explore today. Across this morning, we will argue that these things can live together, and in fact, they must live together. Think about it this way. If I were to attempt, say, a Yurchenko double pike off the vault, that would not be bold, that would be reckless and potentially life-threatening. But 
Olympic gymnasts spend their entire lives training for the vault. So for them, while it's never entirely risk-free, it's just another day at the gym. It, similarly, it, it'd be hard for any of us to take a corner at 90 miles an hour without the car, the pit crew, and yes, the countless hours of practice of a Chase Elliott. And finally, you do not swing the sledgehammer unless you're either chip gains or you've consulted the blueprint first. <laughs> unless you know with great certainty what is and what is not a load-bearing wall. Time and time again, it all comes down to practice, right? The things we do today to prepare for tomorrow. And friends, this is the critical point. It's not just the moments themselves that are bold, right? The jumps, the races, and yes, the DIY home renovation. It's the practice and the preparation that precede those moments that are equally bold. And this is what everyday bold is all about. It's creating the conditions now to confidently and competently break boundaries when we need to do so again in the future. And we believe that you are once again uniquely positioned to take the lead and that this is how you'll do it. Let me share an example. So earlier this summer I was looking for inspiration and I found it in a somewhat unlikely place while scrolling through Disney+. Plus. And that's where I watched Get Back. It's the documentary that Peter Jackson made last year about the Beatles. And it really got me thinking. Now, according to legend, Bing Crosby feared Sinatra. Sinatra feared Elvis, and Elvis feared the Beatles. But the Beatles, they feared no one. They were the epitome of everyday bull. And because of that, they created countless innovations in the studio, on their records, on tour. So, how did they do it? Well, first, they built stability. After some early shakeups, their lineup, and that includes their manager and their producers, remained remarkably consistent over time. Second, they initiated trust. Do you, do you want to know what trust looks like? Trust is the biggest rock and roll band in the world releasing a children's song about a submarine and then letting the drummer sing it. <laughs> Finally, time and time again, they forged ahead. I mean, let's be clear. Beatles could have released two more albums like Revolver, but they chose not to. They chose to do something different. They let go of what had served them well in the past. Heck, what was still serving them well? And in the process, they made Sgt. Pepper. But, alas, we are not in the music business. We are in the people business. Indeed, we are, Brent. Now, remember those mountains, though? The ones beyond other mountains? We're still going to have to climb them. So, as Brent and the Fab Four just showed us, there are three things that we have to do to prepare our organizations to be everyday bold. First, we must build stability. These are the holds that our employees need to feel grounded, to feel oriented. And second, we must initiate trust. Just as rock climbers must trust their gear, our employees must trust us. And they have to believe that we're right there with them to catch them if they fall. And then finally, third, we must forge ahead. We must be willing to let go of some of the things, even if they're serving us well right now, in order to reach new heights. This is how we create the conditions today to continue to break the boundaries of tomorrow. That's exactly right. And what does that get us? Employees at Everyday Bold organizations are six times more likely to be top performers than their counterparts elsewhere. Uh, top performers, Brent? Peak performers? Can we get a pun in there? I'll allow it. Okay. I'll allow it. Well, spoiler alert, there might be a few more puns coming. But top performers, peak performers, whatever we call it, we know we want more of this performance, especially in this environment. So let's talk about how you're going to get there with Everyday Bold. And we'll start with the foundation, 
because there is absolutely one right place to start, and that's to build stability. Even as things might be continuously changing around us. Now, Brent already told us that our role is bigger now. We have more responsibility, and we've tried new things. So we'd love to explore that with you a little bit here today. We're going to get some group participation. Now, we'll ask for a show of hands. Who would say that they have personally broken a boundary over the last three years? You've tried something new, new programs, new skills. OK, don't be shy. Put your hands up. Keep them up there. Put up a second hand if you did it more than once, if you tried more than one thing. OK, full disclosure, it's a little bright up here. Keep those hands up there. I can't see very well, so I'm going to ask you to wave them. <laughs> Let's see. All right, now I can see. Brent, can you see? Look, it's like, it's like an HR rock concert out here. Anya, this is our Taylor Swift moment right now. It is right now. And you know what? I'm still waiting for tickets. <laughs> Hopefully, you had a chance to look around and see that you are in good company here. You can see just how many of us have stepped into something new. And we've made so many gains for our organizations because of it. Here are some of the ones that we hear about the most. We give our workers more flexibility, and so we saw more engagement. We gave our employees options that reduce commute time, and our employees were able to invest that time into things that they found meaningful. And we opened the door to new groups of talent that broadened our workforce. So lots of great results that were able to come our way. But, and you could probably guess that there was a but coming here, there was a cost. When we broke the boundaries that were constraining us, we also lost some of the helpful things, things like norms, cues, guideposts, things that we have relied on in the past to orient us. Now, more and more, we as HR leaders and our employees, too, are noticing that some things feel harder. They feel less clear. Here's what the data shows. It shows that employees are disconnected. Right now, only about a quarter of hybrid or remote employees are telling us that they feel connected to their own organization's culture. And only about 16% of them tell us that they know what to expect from their employer. So, at a time where it feels like we've redefined just about everything, have everything be so new, our employees are less inclined to understand the way that we do things around here. And so when things change, not if things change, when they change, employees don't know what to expect from us as their employers. Now, the good news here, though, is that when we build stability, well, we mitigate some of that. In fact, Stability is not a nice to have. It is a need to have. Stability is integral to everyday bold. It's a prerequisite to ensure that we are not reckless, that we don't endanger ourselves, our teams, or our organizations. But this doesn't mean that stability is about being still or not having motion. Stability is actually about controlled motion. Now, would an Olympic gymnast attempt some of the moves that Brent mentioned if they were not confident that they could control their motion and their body in the air? Absolutely not. And you know who knows that? An Olympic gymnast by the name of Simone Biles. She's actually the reason that we call that Yurchenko double pike the Biles two now, because just a few weeks ago, she became the most decorated gymnast of all time. But last Olympic, she experienced what she called the twisties. She temporarily lost her ability to control her own body in the air. And so she immediately stepped back so that she wouldn't sustain an injury. And actually, she stepped back from competition altogether for a couple of years. Simone Biles recognized the value of stability. She said she valued protecting her mind and her body, even though so many other people were pressuring her to do other things. It's important to note here that during this time, Simone Biles didn't lose her strength. She didn't lose her technical knowledge. She just became disoriented. And so to regain her stability, she needed to do that in order to continue to achieve some of the highest scores of all time in gymnastics. 
So let's return to our mountains. We create the stability by giving employees something to hold on to. And climbers, they even have a name for it, handholds. Handholds are what climbers use to hold on, and they get the ability to feel grounded, to feel oriented. They can use it for rest, they can use it to figure out what the next step is, and ultimately, they use them as a point of leverage. So isn't it natural that we give some of this to our employees too? We went out looking to see what this could be like at organizations. And while there's one right place to start in stability, what we found is that stability can take many forms, lots of different ways that organizations could think about it. And we're going to give you two ways to use as examples to get started. And we'll start with NASA, space agency. Recently, they've been defining their strategy for how they will work in the future. But what they quickly found was that it wasn't enough at NASA to define how they will work now, they would also have to articulate how they work in the future. Because as it turns out, employees who work on space all day, they care about the future. So they developed a future of work framework, a set of core principles that all employees can count on. And it covers topics like AI, automation, analytics, algorithms. NASA doesn't know exactly what will happen in all of those areas, but they have a plan in place. They use this plan to make crucial decision about how they'll adopt new policies, new procedures moving forward. And NASA builds these frameworks with the input of their employees early and often. And then they communicate them to just about everybody, employees, leaders, future employees. These are the stable holds for their workforce. And this stability might also help explain why NASA is rated as the top employer for US government agencies. Here's another example, Amazon. As you can imagine, they spend a lot of time thinking about how you can get your packages faster. But they also spend a lot of time thinking about reskilling their employees. Because they, just like all of us here, are experiencing employees who are feeling unsure about their careers what the future holds, especially as technology changes around them. So to address this, Amazon made a pledge, upskilling 2025. And with this pledge, the company makes graduate level training free of cost available to their employees through the Machine Learning University. They have dedicated programs, they have certifications, and even paid study time during the work week. They give their employees stability through access to the tools that enable them to continue their careers. And they build talent pipelines at the same time. Those are two ideas, two examples. But what we'd like for you to take away is not that you have to do exactly what NASA does or exactly what Amazon does, but that each organization in this room can and should figure out their own way to be able to turn to their employees and communicate these are the stable things that you can hold on to because that's what we're going to be asked to do as HR leaders, even as soon as next Monday morning, once we're back at our desks and back with our teams. Now, here at Gartner, we found that organizations who do this well, that can offer these stable handholds, they experience employee engagement levels that are, wait for it, 61% higher than organizations who do not. 61%. And I bet you can, you can tell why there's some excitement in my voice there. We know as HR leaders how hard it is to get an engagement level to shift by just a percentage point or two, but a difference of 61%, I think I can honestly say in nearly 20 years of work in HR, and Brent, back me up here, this is arguably the most powerful accelerant of engagement we have ever seen here at Gartner. And stability? That's just the foundation of Everyday Bold. That's right, Anya Kay. Everyday Bold is built on stability, but it runs on trust. Now, trust is the belief in someone's ability and reliability. So to return to our mountaineering metaphor, climbers must trust their gear, right, the various ropes and carabiners that they employ, as well as their team, especially the belayer. That's the person who'll catch them if they fall. 
And without that trust, they're either going to end up stranded on the side of that cliff or, worse yet, not on it at all. So let me be very clear. There is no everyday bold without trust. Everyday bold requires commitment, but employees who distrust their organizations are three times more likely to leave. Everyday bold requires hard work, but employees who don't trust their organization display lower levels of discretionary effort. And finally, everyday bold requires new ideas, but employees who don't trust their organizations are less likely to share those ideas with their managers. And unfortunately, at a time when we need it the most, both to maintain the progress that we've made and to continue breaking boundaries, trust is in awfully short supply these days. I would go so far as to say that we are currently experiencing a trust crisis. Only about half of employees trust their organizations. And not only do they not trust us, we don't trust them. Only 63% of organizations trust their employees. Just think about that. Four in 10 organizations don't trust their employees? How do you run a business like that, let alone one that aspires to be everyday bold? Now, there are many ways that we could illustrate this trust gap, but let's take a look at just one. Pay equity. Only about one-third, one-third, of employees agree that their pay is fair or equitable. They don't trust us. Meanwhile, only 12% of organizations actually share pay equity goals with their employees. And please note, I'm not talking about the progress they've made against those goals, just the goals themselves. We don't trust them. So it's a standoff. And I know, I know, this, this is a tough issue. Sadly, this is not unique to the world of human resources. I, mean, I think we all know trust is hard for everyone. So what do we do? Who blinks first? You do. Let me explain. Now, here at Gartner, we conduct research, as you might have gathered, Lots and lots of research, and this gives us the opportunity to interview experts on every conceivable topic, including trust. So, on a recent episode of Gartner's Talent Angle podcast, please like and subscribe, we asked Dr. Peter Kim what we should do to resolve the aforementioned standoff. Here's what he had to say. What does Netflix do? Uh, it has a simple rule. Uh, work in Netflix's best interest. And that's it, right? And, and, and think about that as, as the counterpoint to an over-regulated, uh, monitored kind of organization designed to, uh, to uh, mitigate risk. Uh, it, it's not allowing for trust. But if you have trust, then suddenly those kinds of rules and regulations become less important because the people who are there are are expected to be trustworthy. You give them the benefit of the doubt, most people will fulfill that expectation. If you give employees the benefit of the doubt, most people, certainly not all, will fulfill that expectation. In other words, you have to trust your employees before they trust you. But here's the thing. Right? Trusting our employees before they trust us can feel a little bit reckless, not unlike DIY home renovation. So, to mitigate that feeling of recklessness, many organizations have chosen to invest in some form of employee monitoring. Right? As it stands today, about 71% of employees are digitally monitored in some way, shape, or form. And some estimate that the market for those technologies could top two billion dollars by the end of the decade. Now, I know, there are many good reasons why you might choose to monitor your employees. Safety, compliance, just 
making sure that the work you need them to do is getting done. The key, though, is to recognize that monitoring is not now, nor will it ever be, a substitute for trust. Friends, what if I told you that Gartner had discovered a revolutionary new technology with the potential to disrupt that $2 billion market for less than $5. Behold the humble mouse jiggler. <laughs> it's just going to keep doing that, folks. Get comfortable. Now, it's amazing what you can do with a fan, some wire, and a whole lot of washi tape. Also, between us, I did not build this contraption. Anya did. And look, I, I know, I know. We're having some fun with this example. I know it will take more than simple mouse jiggling to outsmart all of our monitoring attempts to make sure that our status never strays too far from green on Microsoft Teams. But I want you to consider the following data point as well. When we're watching them, almost a third of employees confess that they focus on certain tasks, not because they're priorities, but because they're the activities we're monitoring. So, even if employees can't outsmart the tech, and let's be honest, they probably can, that tech could prompt them to focus on lower value activities. So how do we trust employees first? Well, first, you need to actively signal trust in both their ability and their reliability. Then, if you do choose to monitor them, you need to help them understand how that will benefit them. The trucking company, Schneider National, does a fantastic job at all three. So, for the next two minutes, I'd like you to picture yourself behind the wheel of a Freightliner Cascadia semi-truck. Any way you look at it, this is a serious piece of machinery. It can be 80 feet long. It can weigh as much as 80,000 pounds. The, the cab has more computing power than my Gartner-issued laptop, and it looks more like the cockpit of a jet than anything I have ever driven. Fresh off the lot, one of these will cost you somewhere in the neighborhood of $160,000 to $230,000. Now, as you might imagine, asking anyone to drive one of these things, particularly over great distances for long stretches of time, requires an incredible amount of trust. So, how does Schneider build and maintain trust with their drivers while still investing in the monitoring technologies to keep them safe? Well, first, they put three cameras in the trucks. You've got a forward-facing dash cam and two mounted underneath the side mirrors. Now, those cameras help drivers monitor the road, and in the event of an accident, the company can review those recordings to see what happened. Please note, while they could very easily record everything that driver says or does in the cab, they choose not to. That signals trust in the driver's ability and reliability. And finally, they disclose the use of this technology to all potential applicants, not employees, applicants on their careers page. And they communicate the use case, they communicate the value simply and succinctly. We can protect our drivers with the truth. The result is a cost saver that does double duty as a safety enhancer. And since implementing the new monitoring technology, they've seen a 68% reduction in total collisions and a 95% reduction in severe collisions. Now, I know, most of us do not employ large populations of long haul truckers, so please, let me shift gears. <laughs> we warned you there was another one coming. <laughs> to examine what initiating trust would look like for one of those mountains that we identified earlier, generative AI. 
BCG recently volunteered 800 of their consultants to participate in an academic study in which they would be given free reign to experiment with Gen AI. Not on little things like streamlining expense reports, but on major work streams. Things like designing new products for underserved markets. And what they found is that when their consultants partnered with AI, they completed more tasks, more quickly, and at higher levels of quality. More importantly, by actively signaling belief in their employees' ability and reliability, they built trust. Better work, more trust, that's a win-win. Now, when organizations trust their employees, even before their employees trust them, they can increase discretionary effort by 39%. Again, that's a measure of just how hard they're willing to work. Now, at low trust organizations, just 17% of employees bring new ideas to their managers. However, at high trust organizations, that number jumps to 79%. Now, remember, these are the very same ideas that you will need to confidently and competently continue to break boundaries in the future, to be everyday bold. Brent, I love that statistic about new ideas because we're going to need so many of them. As we lead our organizations to break the boundaries still ahead of us, we will find that we may have to let go of old ideas about what we thought would work to make room for what we will need in the future. That's what it means to forge ahead. And that's certainly a lesson that Junko Tabei has already learned. She's not a name that is often recognized, but Junko was a Japanese mountain climber. And in fact, she was the first female to summit Mount Everest in 1975. First female, but not first climber. She was actually the 38th, 36th, 39th, kind of depends what ranking you use. But in preparation for her climb, Junko, like many climbers, she poured over the notes and the routes and the records from others who had previously summited. And in fact, since it took her four years to obtain a climbing permit for Mount Everest, she and her team had plenty of time to go over just about every imaginable scenario. Literally years. And yet, despite all this planning, when it was Junko's turn to summit, she found that her expected route, it wouldn't get her to the top at all. All of the other climbers had failed to note in their records how small the summit area was. And they also failed to note the extremely dangerous thin ridge of ice that preceded it. It actually called for a completely different climbing technique. So in order to forge ahead to get to the top, Junko had to let go of her plans and instead recalibrate to a new strategy, one that would serve her better for what was actually ahead of her. Junko learned in 1975 what we as HR leaders need to take on board starting today. And that is, to really keep forging ahead, you're going to have to let go. You are going to have to let go. And that can be scary. Those things that we hold on to, those, those handholds that we've been using, we're holding on to them because they're good for what we need now. They feel comfortable. But that doesn't mean that that's what will get us to the next step. What we will find time and time again is that we may have to let go of something good enough or good for now in order to make room for something great that's still to come. Much like Junko, HR leaders will discover that for all of our preparation, all of our study, we may just have to be willing to shift our plans. And we see organizations doing that right now. We see organizations shifting their mindset on key HR questions and letting go of previously held beliefs. For example, like where we might look for qualified talent. You know, so often companies express frustration as they seek to make good on their DEI commitments. They find themselves asking, why won't diverse talent come to us? And why won't they stay? Discover Financial Services flipped that question on its head. They let go of that approach, 
And they asked instead, why aren't we better at going to the talent that we say we value, the talent that we say we want, the diverse talent that we want in our ranks? So last year, Discover took a new tack. They opened a customer care facility in Chatham, it's a neighborhood in the south of Chicago, in a vacated warehouse. They committed to hiring 1,000 customer care employees from the local community, and it's been less than a year, and they're well over halfway to their goal. By putting themselves at the center of a community of talent, well, the business results for them flowed naturally. Discover is experiencing attrition that is half, of any customer call care center. They have an onboarding speed that's faster, and they have performance metrics that are the highest of any of their centers. These are impressive numbers, but when you talk to the leaders of that customer call care center, what, will what they will tell you is that what really makes it special is that feeling of community, of connectedness, of inclusion that their employees experience because they are able to work close to their community. So the inclusion and the belonging that they have because of that, this happened for Discover all because they were willing to let go of their former thinking about where and how to interact with their talent. And it's not just in the private sector that we see these examples, we see them in the public sector too. The Maryland state government, they officially announced last year that they will no longer require four-year degrees for thousands of jobs. They led by example here, but Pennsylvania, Utah, Arkansas, Virginia closely followed suit. Some private sector companies are too. And this is all because Maryland was willing to challenge an established norm. By letting go of some of these expectations of traditional qualifications, these organizations have broadened their talent pools to better serve their needs for the future and to better serve their citizens. Now, for some organizations, forging ahead will mean redefining what they offer workers. And perhaps one of the most contentious questions we have right now, one of the hottest debates, is how to interact with the office today. Smuckers took a different approach here. Instead of mandating a certain number of days per week in the office, which, by the way, Gartner research shows doesn't have significant impact on team performance, They've designated and said a set of core weeks. They make the office a destination during this time. They focus on connection. They focus on work that is best done in person. And what's really interesting here is that Smuckers was willing to let go of the debate that seems to be raging in the headlines and instead to focus on what works best for them. And finally, there's the question of who should do the work. And this is something that we're seeing a lot, especially as organizations think through generative AI. Should we do human labor, automated labor, a combination of both? But there's actually a simpler question that we can ask first. And that's, where can we let go of work that's not critical to begin with, no matter who's going to do it? So here's a more radical example for you. Shopify, let go of all their meetings. All of them. <laughs> it's the stuff of dreams, right? <laughs> we might dream about it. Shopify actually did it. They took off all their recurring meetings off the calendar this past January when employees came back in from the holidays. They gave employees a chance to rethink what was actually needed. And here's the really cool thing. To put the meetings back, they put in a plugin so that every time you send a calendar invite, it automatically calculates the cost of the meeting based on who's there and how long it is. Let's imagine for a moment if we calculated the cost of this meeting. Worth every penny, every one. That is right. <laughs> Now, look, Shopify will quickly point out that their intent wasn't to cancel every single meeting forever. They just wanted to let go of their assumptions that so many employees had about meetings and who had to be there and how long they had to be. They trust now, and there's that word again, 
that employees can take a look at the meetings go or for going forward, evaluate the time they should take and who should be there, and make the best call to take the business forward, to forge ahead. So who, what, where, these are all places where we can challenge ourselves to let go. Now, remember, letting go isn't always easy. It can come with emotions. And in fact, sometimes it might feel like we're losing something in the process. Ben and Jerry's, ice cream company, we all know and love them for their flavors. They've learned this over the years. And rather than fight that feeling of loss, they actually acknowledge it instead. Ben and Jerry's knows that any flavor that they bring to market, that's the result of collaboration, of ideas, of teamwork, of hard work. But they also know that not every flavor will be around forever. So when the time comes for a flavor to retire, Ben and Jerry's, they lay it to rest <laughs> in the flavor graveyard. <laughs> it's a symbolic gesture, but it really marks the moment and recognizes the contributions of so many before they make room for more creativity and ultimately more flavors. Now, a graveyard might not be for everyone here, but acknowledging change or acknowledging loss, that is something that all employees need. They need it to forge ahead for what's still to come. So what happens when we let go? We have proven through Gartner research that the impact on the workforce is tremendous. In fact, organizations that are the best at letting go, they have employees who are 10 times more likely to say that their organization enables innovation. This is a key outcome of Everyday Bold. Friends, I want to remind you that this idea of Everyday Bold is not a nice to have. No, no, no. Your organization needs you to be Everyday Bold. Furthermore, I want, to, I want you to remember that the key to reconciling the tension between the Everyday and the Bold is to recognize that time and time again, it all comes down to practice. Remember, that is how we'll create the conditions today to competently and confidently continue to break boundaries in the future. And, once again, what are those three conditions? We must build stability, initiate trust, and forge ahead. We will need all three of these things to support our HR functions in everyday bold. As we head into that horizon of mountains beyond mountains, that's going to keep out extending for us. But we do have two opportunities right now, right in front of us, where we can put everyday bold to the test, or rather, into practice. And the first opportunity is in building a more inclusive workforce. Look, legislative tides are turning, and landscapes are shifting, but yet we already know as HR leaders, that being inclusive is key to delivering great results for our business and for our talent. And so we can apply this framework of Everyday Bold right here, right away, to have actionable steps with our teams. We can make calls on stability, identifying where we have gaps with employees who might be feeling disconnected or disoriented. Engagement surveys are a great place to start here. Look specifically for demographics of underrepresented groups where there's a gap to belonging or a gap to inclusion. That information, that'll give you valuable leads on where to put your handholds first. What do you make stable first? Trust will be vital. In order to get employees to trust us with their most sensitive information so we can serve them better on inclusion, we will have to trust them first. And this means picking one or two areas where we might want to communicate proactively. You know, so often when it comes to DEI metrics and goals, employees tell us that it feels like we get to a black box pretty quickly. So pick one area where you are willing to go first with your commitment. Could be pay equity goals, diversity goals, leadership goals. Orient those communications around the benefit to employees. And forging ahead for inclusion, inclusive workforces, that might mean letting go of some previous approaches. So now is the time to audit your DEI strategy for 2024, 
Look with a critical eye for spots where you can let go of what's holding you back. You can use this opportunity to think through how you show up for talent, just like Discover did. Next up, we have generative AI. So to build stability, we first have to identify the folks who are experiencing the greatest instability. You can do that by, again, inserting a few questions into pre-existing employee surveys to gauge the current level of AI-induced anxiety in your organization. Alternately, you could address that anxiety head-on by reminding folks that new technology is more likely to transform their roles than it is to eliminate them entirely. To initiate trust, borrow paid from the BCG handbook. Build partnerships across the C-suite to identify how and when you too can allow your own employees to experiment. And I don't know what they'll do or what they'll learn, but I guarantee it will amaze you. Finally, to forge ahead, I want you to sit down with your HR leadership teams next week to brainstorm your response to the following scenario. Your recruiting team is using AI to evaluate a resume, which was itself developed using AI, submitted by a candidate who is applying for a job that they found using AI, and whose description you wrote using AI. Friends, that's not science fiction. This is the world we live in today. So, how will the humans and human resources forge ahead? when AI reshapes the most fundamental work we do. Brent, it's so much for us to take in. And now for us, for Brent and I, we wouldn't be doing our jobs up here today if we didn't admit that many more challenges lie ahead. But we like to put it differently. We think of it as many more opportunities to practice our framework of everyday bold. But that's exactly why we are all here right now to spend these next days together. I know that we can say to you with full confidence that you, as HR leaders, you have never been better positioned to meet this moment. Your potential for impact has never been greater. You have more authority and influence. Your platform has never been stronger. The opportunity for you is right here, right now, on this path to everyday bold. And we'll get there together. We have the tools to start embracing everyday bold in each decision we'll face moving forward. Because, I gotta tell you, the view from up there and the view from up here, well, friends, they're pretty great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.